the first part of our study of HTTP, we looked at some of the basics. We learned about the different types of HTTP connections, persistent and non-persistent. We looked at the basic message types used by HTTP, request and get, and we also looked at the issue of cookies. In this section, we're gonna start off by looking at two techniques for improving user perceived performance. That is the latency from a web request until is made by a client until the page is actually displayed. We're gonna look at web caching and we're gonna look at the conditional get. Then we're gonna move on, take a look at HTTP2, which is the current version of HTTP, and then a look into the future very quickly and take a look at HTTP3. Well, let's start out with web caching, a very powerful technique that's used to improve user perceived performance and also decrease the load on the origin server and on institutional resources, particular institutional access links. It's a win all around. Web caching is widely deployed and used around the web, and the idea is pretty simple. An institution installs a web cache, and users configure their browsers to point to this local web cache. Now, whenever a browser wants to make a request to an origin server, it first sends its HTTP request to the cache, if the object requested is found in the cache, the cache will return the object directly to the client. The origin server is not even involved. Otherwise, the cache is going to request the object from the origin server, cache the received object, and then return the object to the client. And here in this animation, you can see caching in action. The client on the top first makes an HTTP request, it's routed to the cache, the content is not found in the cache, and so the cache then requests the object from the origin server. The object's returned from the origin server, cached at the cache, and the response is provided to the client. Now, a second client comes along, makes an HTTP request for the same object. In this case, the object's in the cache and returned immediately from the cache to the client. The origin server is not even involved in this second request. Well, in this example, we've seen that a web cache acts in both a client and a server role. It operates as a server with respect to the original requesting client, but it also acts as a client to the origin server. And the origin server can tell the cache about the object's allowable caching behavior. This would be contained in the response header in an HTTP response message coming back from the origin server. For example, the cache control header can say, it's a maximum amount of time that an object could be cached or that maybe an object should not be cached at all. So we can already see the answers to this question. Why are we doing web caching? Well, we're going to be able to reduce the response time for the client request because the cache is closer to the client. And we're also going to be able to reduce traffic on an institution's access link because the origin server is not downloading content so frequently. Now let's see how we can quantify these performance benefits. And let's look at the scenario shown here on the right. We've got an institutional network and we've got the public internet where the origin servers live. We have an access link between the institutional network and the public internet that runs at 1.544 megabits per second. And this is going to be the bottleneck link that we wanna focus on in this scenario. The RTT from the institutional router to an origin server, let's say it's two seconds. And let's say that a web object has a size of 100K bits. Now, the average request rate from browsers in the institutional network out to origin servers is 15 requests per second. So 15 requests per second at 100K bits per object that's being downloaded means that on average, data is flowing from the public internet into the institutional network as a result of HTTP gets at 1.5 megabits per second. Now, that average incoming data rate to browsers of 1.50 megabits per second looks suspiciously close to the link access rate of 1.54 megabits per second. If we do a quick calculation of the access link utilization, we see that the utilization is 0.97. That's really high. If we look at the utilization of the links from the institutional router out to the clients, let's say they're connected by gigabit per second ethernet, we see that their utilization is 0.0015. Now, if we want to take a look at the end-to-end -end delay, there's going to be three components. There's going to be the internet delay. Once we get out to the internet, what's the delay to the origin servers? 
there's going to be queuing delays associated with the access link coming into the institutional network. And then there's going to be a transmission and queuing delay associated with transmission within the institution's local area network. Now, the internet delay, the RTT, is on the order of two seconds. The real problem here is at the access link. We've got an access link utilization of 0.97, so queuing delays can be very high here on the order of minutes. And when we look at delays in the institutional network, well, there the LAN utilization is 0.0015, and so we can assume that delays are on the orders of microseconds. Again, these are just back of the envelope calculations. Well, what are we to do here? How can we improve user performance? Well, the first option is just to buy a faster access link. For instance, we could upgrade from 1.54 megabits per second to 154 megabits per second. That's going to decrease the access utilization to 0 0.0097. That means that rather than long queuing delays, we'll have short queuing delays for packets coming into the network. So this will solve our problem of course, the problem here is that a faster access link could be very expensive. Our second option, of course, would be to install a web cache. We've already seen by example that having a web cache is a three for win. Lower page load times for users, decreased load on the access link for the institution, and a decreased load on the origin server. But how do we quantify these benefits? Now let's look at how to estimate the link utilization and the end-to-end -end delay with a cache. Let's assume that 40% of the requests are served by the cache in the institutional network. This means that 40% of the requests are going to see really small delays, milliseconds or less, since there's almost no propagation delay within the institutional network and data is being sent over a local gigabit link. Now, 60% of the requests will still need to be sent to the origin server. And let's suppose that you're the network engineer who convinced your boss to get a web cache rather than an upgraded link. So you've still got that 1.54 megabit per second link. How do things look for you? Well, don't worry, it's gonna be okay. The clients are still consuming data at 1.5 megabits per second, but now only 60% of that traffic is coming from the public internet and over the access link. The rate at which data is arriving for the clients at the access link is 1.5 megabits per second times 0 0.6. That's only 0.9 megabits per second, making the link access utilization only 0.58. It's a lot less than 0.97, and queuing delays here at the access link are going to be minimal. Well, we can compute the average end-to-end -end delay as follows. 60% of the page loads have the download delay from the origin servers. Two seconds of delay from the origin servers to the access network, then a little queuing delay, say 10 milliseconds, at the access link. 40% of the page loads are satisfied at the cache with millisecond delays. So the overall average end-to-end -end delay is 0 0.6 times 2.01 seconds plus 0 0.4 times a delay that's measured in the millisecond range, giving an average end-to-end -end delay of around 1.2 seconds. Not only did your recommendation to buy a web cache cost less than upgrading the link speed, but you've cut user page load times in half. You're a hero. In addition to web caching, there's a second form of caching that's widely used in the internet. And in the second form of caching, the client's own host computer and browser are used. And the idea is really simple. If the client already has a current, up-to-date copy of a piece of content, there's no reason for a web server to send that again. There's no transmission delay and no network resources would be consumed. The question, of course, is how does the client know that the copy that it has is still up to date? Well, this is solved as follows. When making an HTTP request to a server, a client will include an if modified since field, indicating the date at which the object was last retrieved from the web server. And a web server is going to then respond to such a request in one of two ways. If the client's copy is current, then the web server will respond with a 304 not modified message and will not send the object to the client. If the object has been modified and the server has a more up-to-date copy, the server is just going to reply with the usual 202 OK response message and include a more recent version of the object. And note that for both types of caching, whether it's a web cache or whether it's the conditional HTTP GET, 
the user perceived performance is going to be better and less network resources are used. A double win. Web caching and the conditional get that we just studied were both aimed at improving user perceived performance, in particular page load latency. The current version of HTTP is known as HTTP 2, and it has additional enhancements aimed at further improving the user experience. Let's take a quick look at that and then an even quicker look into the future at HTTP 3. Probably the key goal of HTTP 2 was to decrease the delay associated with transmitting multi-object HTTP requests. The methods and status codes and most of the header fields are pretty much unchanged from HTTP 1.1. What's different, however, is the following. The transmission order of the requested objects can be based on some kind of client-specified object priority, not necessarily first come, first serve. The server is also allowed to push unrequested, but maybe future requested objects to the client in advance. Perhaps most importantly, large objects can be divided into what are called frames, and frames can be scheduled in such a way to mitigate what's known as head of the line blocking. Let's take a look at what head of the line blocking is. Here's an example where an HTTP 1.1 client requests one large object, for example, a video file, and then three smaller objects. As you can see here, the objects are transmitted first come first serve by the server, and so the first object is transmitted, takes a long time. Objects two, three, and four, the smaller files, have to wait their turn. And this has probably happened to you at checkout counters, right? You get to a checkout at the supermarket, there's somebody with a huge loaded cart, and you've just got a loaf of bread. Why can't you get through the checkout counter first and then serve the person with the cart full of groceries? Well, a similar idea is used in HTTP 2. Large objects are divided into frames, and frame transmissions from one object can be interleaved with the transmission of frames or other objects. So in this example here, objects 2, 3, and 4 delivered quickly, and object 1 is actually only slightly delayed and thus giving better overall performance and lower average object delay. Well, there are still some improvements that can be made to HTTP 2, particularly having to do with the effects of packet loss and the lack of security on TCP connections. These are being addressed in HTTP 3, which will be released in 2021, and we'll take a closer look at HTTP 3 when we get to the transport layer. Well, that concludes our two-part study of the web and HTTP as an application layer, well, application and an application layer protocol. And we've learned a tremendous amount. In the second part, we were really focused on performance. We saw how caching and the conditional get can improve user-perceived page load latencies. And we saw how HTTP version 2, the current version of HTTP, has some additional enhancements also aimed at improving user-perceived latency. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at an application, email, and a protocol, SMTP, that have been around a lot longer, decades longer, than HTTP. That's coming up next.